Alrighty. So in this lesson, we're going to be talking about describing radio frequency principles. Very, very important concept here because uh, obviously on the radio side of any wireless network, we have to deal with the radio frequency spectrum. So to understand Wi-Fi technologies, we have to have a clear concept of how the wireless side works at the physical layer. Um, and that includes, of course, radio frequency communication. Uh, so what we're going to talk about here is the basics of the radio frequency spectrum uh, for radio and wireless communication. We'll talk about uh, frequencies for communication, uh, their relationship to what we call wavelength. We'll talk about the features and the effect of communication on that wavelength of the signal uh, and how that effectively changes the behavior of the wireless network itself. The importance of amplitude, uh, various elements of things like free path loss, uh, absorption, reflection, multipath uh, components, anything that's going to affect the transmitted signal. Um, talk about how different types of materials uh, deal with that or affect that. Uh, the effects of scattering and diffusion, uh, refraction of radio signals, wireless communication, characteristics and effects of line of sight, uh, the Fresnel zone, uh, not Fresnel, but uh, the Fresnel zone. Uh, and how we calculate that and the effect of that communication. And then the relationship that I alluded to in the previous lesson, which was the relationship between RSSI and SNR and how they affect the overall communication and signal quality. Because when it comes down to it, those are really the two things that we concern ourselves with the most, which is the radio, the RSSI and the uh, signal to noise ratio. So a lot of interesting things in this chapter, a little bit more technical, uh, but uh, um, it, and it's a precursor to the next lesson, which is even more technical, which is dealing with the mathematics and antenna theory and whatnot. Obviously, when it comes to the actual uh, spectrum, the RF spectrum, we have audio, we have radio, we have visible, and we have x-ray spectrum. So it's not just wireless signaling, right? It's not just radio frequencies that we're talking about when we talk about the entire spectrum. We have sonic spectrum, we have ultrasonic spectrum, amplitude modulation, frequency modulation, uh, television, microwave, infrared, and so on. A lot of devices use radio waves to send information, but the radio component is only a small portion of the overall RF spectrum. Light is an example of an electromagnetic energy and the eye interprets light and uh, sends, hold on. Hey, Scott, I think you're muted. Dang it, I was muted. Yep, about that. I missed that. <laughs> I lost you right after you sent the dog out. Yes, okay. Uh, well, I didn't say much, um, but I will repeat what I said just so that uh, you get it.
<clears throat> what I was saying was that uh, that essentially we have all of these different spectrums that we're dealing with. Obviously, we're focusing on the spectrums that we cannot see or cannot hear, um, which is the, the radio frequency spectrum. Even in the infrared space, we get into that uh, infrared space. Now, that's the visible spectrum. Um, uh, but we get into uh, things like infrared and ultraviolet. We can't see those, uh, those, um, those light, those, that light. We have a visible spectrum within the terahertz range there. But uh, for the most part, we're obviously going to focus our, our uh, attention on in the wireless spectrum here, where we go from 1 gigahertz up to 10 gigahertz, maybe up to 100 gigahertz if we're dealing with uh, you know, microwaves and so on. The other thing I said was we're going to talk about some very basic concepts. Uh, hi, Tiju. How are you doing? Is it is it Tiju? I don't think he's joined the audio bridge just yet. Um, our other uh, classmate has joined us. Uh, when you get uh, audio, I'll I'll chat with you again. Yeah, he's still he's still joining. Now, I was saying that, yeah, we're going to talk about some basic are you smarter than a fifth grader concepts here, right? Uh, things that we learn about in elementary school. But I think it is really important when, when we talk about, you know, uh, the basic concepts of wireless communication. Frequency being, of course, the number of occurrences of a repeated event, whether it's a radio frequency signal or not, uh, that happens within a particular time period. The period is actually the duration of time of one cycle in a repeating event. So, so the period is the, uh, is the reciprocal of the frequency. All right. Uh, we call that a cycle. We can see the cycle represented here, two cycles per second, two hertz, uh, four cycles per second, four hertz, seven cycles per second, seven, seven hertz, and so on. Uh, there is a difference between period versus frequency. Um, as a matter of convenience, uh, longer and slower waves, like if you're talking about like ocean waves, tend to be described by a period rather than a frequency, but we don't really use the term period in, in the concept of wireless. There are different types of frequencies as well. You've got angular frequencies and then you've got spatial frequencies. Uh, and so on. But with wave propagation, which is what we typically talk about, uh, we're, we're just dealing with, um, you know, uh, essentially uh, a, uh, I lost my train of thought here, just a basic radio frequency wave, right? Now, what's very interesting about the concept that you see here is that when you're dealing with uh, there, there, well, there is a direct relationship between the frequency of a signal, which is how often the signal is seen, and the wavelength of that signal, which is the distance that the signal travels in one cycle. The shorter the wavelength, the more often the signal repeats itself over a given period of time, which then directly relates to a higher frequency, right? So one million times per second is a megahertz, uh, and that signal occurs one billion times per second, uh, or a signal that occurs one billion times per second is a gigahertz, right? Is uh, 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 defined as a gigahertz. Now, in the terms of wireless networking, lower frequency signals get less affected by the air than higher frequency signals. The uh, uh, concept is actually kind of counterintuitive, right? You would think that higher frequency signals would be less affected. But because of the cycles are occurring over a shorter period of time, we actually have more of an effect on the higher frequency signals than the, than the lower frequency signals. They have an example in the book. It says the effect of the air that has on sound can be seen in everyday life. When a car that is playing loud music approaches, the first, it, uh, the first sounds that you hear are the drums and the bass because the lower frequencies travel farther than the higher frequency ones uh, uh, being affected by the air. Uh, we hear that all the time. It's kind of annoying. All right. Uh, another concept is wavelength. Uh, obviously, wavelength is a, uh, you know, a, a definition of, or defines the, 
the space between the peaks of a particular signal. Uh, the signal gets generated um, at the transmitter. It gets sent to the antenna. The movement of the electrons generate this electromagnetic field. We're actually going to get into the, the details of that and the math of that a little bit later on. Uh, and that's what generates this electromagnetic wave. The size or the cycle of that pattern is what we call the wavelength, right? So let me go into a little bit more detail. An RF signal starts with an electrical AC signal uh, generated by some sort of oscillator or some sort of transmitter. The signal is sent through the cable uh, to an antenna where the signal is then radiated in the form of an electromagnetic wireless signal. Now, there are some terms I want to introduce here because we're going to see these later, but it's always good to kind of see them multiple times. The signal that is the signal that is extracted from the antenna uh, is sent out at a specific power level, and that is called the effective isotropic radio power. We are actually going to see how to calculate EIRP from a system, particularly a wireless system. Very important concept because there are multiple things that go into uh, the overall uh, effective isotropic radio power that comes out of a, an antenna. You've got, of course, the transmit power of the access point. You've got loss between the connectors and the cabling that goes between the access point and the antenna. And then you have something called antenna gain which amplifies the signal uh, and then allows us to transmit the signal. So there's a lot of things that are occurring in order for us to generate these electrons and the electron flow in the antenna. Um, there's current that gets generated that produces changes in electromagnetic fields around the antenna and then that gets transmitted uh, as, as our radio frequency signal. Uh, an AC is an electrical current uh, in which the direction of the current cycles uh, changes uh, cyclically. So alternating current, the current changes cyclically, right? So the shape of the form of that AC signal actually is what defines the waveform. And you can see it's kind of identified here, the green one and the blue one and the orange one as a sine wave. The shape is the same as the signal that the antenna uh, radiates. Now, that's a very simplified, and the book is describing this. I mean, I'm not really going into a whole lot of additional detail here, but that's a very simplified way of looking at how these radio frequencies are transmitted from an antenna. But it's actually much more complex than that because there's polarization involved as well. And we'll see that when we get into the antenna theory discussion a little bit later on. The physical distance from one point of a cycle to the same point in the next cycle, that's what's called the wavelength. Obviously, when that distance is shorter, we're, doing a, we, we're operating at a higher frequency because frequency and wavelength are directly related to each other. If you remember on the previous slide, we talked about frequency as the amount of, of uh, essentially cycles that occur within a time period. One second is the time period. Um, but where you see the designation of cycle here, this is the wavelength, right? So frequency is how often, um, <clears throat> how often you see a cycle within a one second period. That's what the, the wavelength, the frequency describes. It's an easy distinction. But if you're asked about it on the exam, it's very important to understand the difference between the two, right? So the wavelength is essentially the cycle itself. And uh, the frequency is how often that cycle occurs within a one second period. All right. Now, this is usually recommended, uh, recommended, uh, usually represented by the Greek symbol lambda. Uh, and uh, the wavelength is defined as the physical difference uh, distance that the wave occurs within one cycle period. There's a, a couple of important concepts about wavelength that are uh, important to understand when it comes to wireless transmission. Obviously, we talked about that distance and that has some properties associated to it, and that defines the properties of those waves. Um, but there are components within our environment, right? Uh, that can actually affect the overall propagation of that wave. The degree of impact 
varies depending on the wavelength and whatever is causing the interference, whether it's water or a filing cabinet uh, or trees or whatever it might be. Uh, and uh, we're going to obviously talk about all those types of interference concepts or models in this particular chapter. AM radio stations, uh, frequency modulated stations, um, Wi-Fi networks and so on. They all operate in about uh, different, uh, um, you know, different wavelengths. An AM radio sta uh, station could be 400 or a wave is 400 or 500 meters long. Whereas in wireless, we use a wave that's only a few centimeters long. Uh, like satellites use like uh, about a one millimeter wavelength. So uh, it's very, very short uh, wavelength. And again, it's important to understand the effect of that wavelength based on uh, or, or how that wave, that sine wave, can be affected by different components in the environment based on the wavelength. <clears throat> Another uh, concept, of course, is amplitude. That's a very easy concept to understand. Uh, it essentially defines the strength of the signal. And uh, uh, multiple things can cause loss of amplitude. Uh, and and uh, going through walls and doorways or whatever, going through water. Uh, there are other interference properties and other characteristics that can occur as well, but obviously loss of signal, uh, which we call attenuation, by the way. Uh, so if you hear the term attenuation, that means that's loss of signal. Um, it can be affected by many different things. So we use this Greek symbol gamma, uh, common representation of amplitude. Amplitude also affects the signal because it represents the level of energy that's injected in one cycle. Uh, the, the more energy you inject uh, in a cycle, the higher the amplitude. Okay. Amplification is uh, the increase of the amplitude of the wave, but it doesn't change the cycle and it doesn't change the frequency. Uh, so you can see here on each of these three represented diagrams here, we're not changing the frequency, we're not changing the wavelength, uh, the cycle, essentially. Um, finding the right amplitude can be imp uh, important. Uh, obviously, as signal propagates through the air or propagates through a, a cable or propagates through a, anything, you're going to have uh, some sort of loss, right? Now, there are a couple of ways to implement amplification. Uh, you can do it actively or passively. In active amplification, uh, amplification, excuse me, where, where actually um, the, uh, the applied power is increased. Passive amplification is uh, where we focus the energy in a direction by using an antenna. So active amplification would be increasing the power at the access point or at whatever device is actually generating the signal. And then passive amplification would be uh, you know, changing the gain of an antenna or using a different type of antenna to focus a, a signal or whatever. Uh, we can also decrease amplitude uh, and decrease, like I said, the term we use to describe that is attenuation. That can be intentionally or it can be unintentionally through just basic loss. Yes, Mike, go ahead. Let me unmute. I lost you for about. Oops, hold on. Three, five seconds. Uh, at what point? Um, pr probably if you went back a minute. <laughs> okay. Minute and a half. But it was on this slide? <laughs> yes, it, it was on this slide, yep. Okay. Well, basically what I was, thank you for letting me know. Uh, I don't know, Tiju, are you on audio now? Can you Can you hear me? You can send a chat message if you like as well. <laughs> Um, yeah, well, let me go back and just describe, Mike, what I was referring to. Um, amplitude, like I said, we're not changing the cycle. We're not changing the frequency. We're not changing the wavelength. We're just simply changing the power. And what I was describing, and I don't know which part you lost there, but what I was describing was uh, how we provide active amplification versus passive amplification. Active amplification is uh, changing the amplitude at the source. So uh, increasing the power, the output power of an access point, for example, would be active amplification. Passive amplification would be where you're, you're changing the amplification 
you're amplifying the signal with an antenna or some other method after the, the signal's been generated. So focusing the energy. Uh, okay, TJ, no problem. Uh, just send a chat message if you, uh, if you have any questions, okay? Uh, and these were recorded as well. So you can go back. You'll be able to go back and listen to the parts that you missed earlier. All right. Um, focusing the energy in one particular direction using an antenna. Also passive amplification as well. Uh, and what I mentioned before as well was loss of signal. Uh, amplitude, I should say, because it's a very specific. We're not talking about actually losing the signal or the signal being modified in a certain way. We're actually talking about loss of amplitude is referred to as attenuation. And attenuation occurs uh, for many, many different reasons. Finding the right amplitude uh, is difficult. Uh, the signal, of course, is going to weaken as it moves away from the emitter. Uh, if the signal gets too weak, then obviously at the receiver, we're going to have a high signal to noise ratio or we're not going to have enough signal strength to be able to identify the ones and zeros, etc. If the signal's too strong, uh, then um, generating it requires too much energy. Uh, maybe it's costly to generate. Maybe it requires too much battery power. Uh, also, we can we can we can I damage the components that are involved in receiving that signal if they're receiving the signal too um, at, at too much of an amplitude. In and we'll talk about this in the next lesson. There are regulations that uh, re require us to follow specific rules when we're transmitting, uh, and again in wireless. In specifically with 802.11 wireless, we talk about EIRP, the effective isotropic radio power. That is the value that's that's defined and specified and regulated by the governing bodies that in the various countries and, and locations throughout the world. Uh, just because an access point can transmit at a certain power, or just because an antenna provides a certain level of gain, doesn't mean that you're actually allowed to uh, to do that, right? Um, in fact, in the United States, you're limited to 100 milliwatts. And uh, we'll talk about that when we get into the regulations and so on. Uh, transmitters can dynamically modify amplitude. Uh, some radio stations use this modulation technique to encode information that they send to uh, a radio receiver. Others prefer to change the frequency of the signal, um, and this is where we go into amplitude, modu uh, amplitude modulation versus frequency modulation. The idea being that we're trying to identify different signals and, and characteristics of signals. We don't really do that in, in 802.11 wireless though. We, we don't try to modify the amplitude or, or the uh, frequency of our radio frequency signal. We will well, we, we technically kind of do modify the frequency in a sense that we're doing frequency hopping to, to avoid interference, but uh, other than that, no. All right. Uh, one of the common <clears throat> things that we'll see with uh, any kind of radio frequency transmission is something called free path loss. All right. Uh, let me see on the right slide here. Yeah. Free path loss. Uh, it is uh, essentially related to, uh, and you might see it referred to as, uh, let me turn that off. Hold on one second here. That's going to interfere with my slide deck here. Give me one second. So free path loss, or what you might also refer to as free space path loss, is really just defined as uh, the attenuation of radio energy between the feed points of the two antennas that result in, uh, you know, from a combination of the receiving antenna's capture area, the obstacle-free line of sight path, uh, meaning that we don't have anything in the space that's actually interfering with the signal uh, through this what we call free space, which is usually just the air, right? Um, the loss between these, these radiators in the free space is expressed as a power ratio. Um, the, I mean, it's a basic concept, right? As the wave moves away from the transmitter, uh, it 
emanates from the transmitter and goes to the emitter, uh, to the, um, the receiver, the amount of energy declines as the distance increases and the quality of the energy available at, at the end point is less as you move away from the emitter. It's a very basic concept, right? Now there is a whole formula that you can use to calculate this uh, um, and uh, there's a bunch of physics that uh, get involved um, where you look at things like inten uh, intensity, uh, antenna capture area, and so on. We don't need to get in into that, but it's typically uh, expressed in terms of decibels. Um, the, the free space path lost is uh, determined in, in um, terms of decibels. And you might see this identified in a wireless environment essentially as your RSSI, right? Your signal strength indication is what's going to allow you to identify um, essentially what, what kind of signal strength you have based on what came from the emitter. Uh, again, measured in, in decibels typically. We'll get into some calculations of that a little bit later on. All right. Um, now, there, we're not talking about loss that is occurring from trees or, or water or, you know, obstacles that, that it might encounter and so on. Um, we're talking about free path loss. So the radio wave that an AP emits uh, gets radiated into the air, uh, whether it's an omnidirectional antenna or a directional antenna. In this particular case, the, the diagram is kind of depicting an omnidirectional antenna where the signal is emitted in all directions. Um, the uh, uh, in a directional sense, the, the beam is more focused, all right, whether it's a, a Yagi antenna or a parabolic dish antenna. But as the signal or wave travels away from the AP, uh, it can be affected by obstacles that are within that space, right? Uh, now, that's not necessarily considered free path loss. The attenuation of the signal strength on its way to the receiver is overall is called free path loss. But the word free here indicates that the loss is simply a result of distance. It doesn't have anything to do with any obstacles or anything in the path. All right. Now there is path loss as well. Obviously path loss would simply include obstacles or other objects that might cause loss. Keep in mind that what causes free path loss is not the distance itself. Right? There's really no reason why a signal is weaker further away from the source. Uh, there's actually a couple of different things, and the book describes this pretty well, um, that cause this. The signal is sent from the emitter in all directions, so that energy has to be distributed over a larger area, uh, kind of concentric circles leaving the, the transmitter. But the amount of energy that was originally sent isn't changing, uh, and conservation of energy law, laws and whatnot dictate that whatever energy is being sent is what's going to be um, distributed, right? So the amount of energy that's available at each point on the circle is higher if the circle is smaller, more concentrated towards the source of the energy uh, than if the circle was larger because you have more points on the circle. If you can imagine, I, I don't know, let's say there's 20 points that we use to identify the signal within this inner circle but I'm using the same 20 points to identify the signal on this outer circle, obviously the points are going to be much further apart, which is supposed to visually represent this concept of loss of energy. In addition, the receiver antenna has a certain physical size. So the amount of energy that gets collected depends on the size of that antenna. A large antenna can collect a lot more information because it's hitting more points on the circle than a smaller antenna. Um, but we cannot pick up more than a portion of the original signal, right? There's no way that this, this device out in this outer circle can pick up all the energy that's dispersed across this entire signal. That's why using a directional antenna uh, with focused uh, beam width would be much more effective in ensuring less loss of power. That's why uh, these point-to-point uh, -point antennas are typically like a Yagi or a <clears throat> patch antenna or, or a, a parabolic dish. They're going to focus that, that uh, energy into one direction. Okay. Uh, the combination of these two factors, what I just described, is what causes that free path loss. 
And like I said, if I could, if I could just pinpoint that frequency and send it on a, a narrow beam, I can reach that uh, device without, with minimal loss or even at a much larger distance. We'll talk about antenna theory and, and how antennas handle that a little bit later on. All right. Another concept, uh, which would not be considered free path loss, is absorption. This is just a basic path loss concept. As the signal travels away from the AP, we already know that it's going to lose energy uh, through that free path loss concept. But if it's passing through different types of material, brick walls, drywall, etc., that material is going to have some properties that uh, absorb that energy as well. Um, dust in the air, uh, water vapor molecules, water molecules, etc., uh, caused by humidity, that's going to all cause uh, absorption. The signal um, can encounter <clears throat> all different kinds of obstacles. Uh, a lead wall, for example, would absorb 100% of the radiated power or the radiation energy that's coming from the access point, whereas drywall might not absorb as much. If the absorption is so high, like 100%, then obviously the wave is not going to pass through the wall. If the absorption is less than 100%, then it's a matter of how much uh, of that signal is degraded. What's very interesting about this concept, though, and I want to uh, make this uh, very clear, is that absorption does not affect wavelength or frequency. It only affects amplitude, which means attenuation, right? You'll notice that the original signal on the left has the same frequency and wavelength as the degraded signal on the right but just less amplitude. So absorption plays uh, a role in attenuation. Absorption of the signal means loss of amplitude. Uh, and of course, loss of amplitude means, um, you know, a degraded signal. So what we'll do if we're building or designing a wireless network is we'll go out and, and we'll uh, do a site survey. If we're doing a passive survey, we'll just identify what kinds of walls, what kind of construction there is, and so on, and, and uh, you know, uh, how many obstacles might exist that can absorb a signal, not reflect or refract or, or scatter a signal, but actually just absorb a signal. And there's actually um, measurements that are done, uh, you know, predefined values, I guess you could say, based on characteristics of uh, properties of construction materials. So, you can identify, oh, it's three quarter inch plywood uh, or drywall, that's gonna absorb X amount of uh, amplitude or, or cause it a certain amount of attenuation. Um, brick walls, glass, etc. all right? Uh, reflection, very simple concept. Signals get reflected, they're bouncing off an object. Now, the reason why this is particularly important is we don't just simply send the signal out in one direction. So the axis point on the left is an omnidirectional axis point. It's sending out a signal, um, and we get this multipath reflection. So when the signal arrives at the receiver, we're actually receiving the same signal at different timestamps, uh, which can actually cause interference. We'll talk about that phenomenon in a little bit here. But essentially, reflection is a very simple concept. When a signal hits an obstacle, uh, the, by design, whatever that obstacle is, will reflect the signal um, because, uh, well, it's a, radio, it's, a, it's a radio frequency signal. It'll bounce off the object. Now, there might be some absorption as well, right? We're not just saying that uh, not everything is a perfect reflector. So there could be some absorption as well, but there could be some reflection. Would reflection cause issues with amplitude? No, unless there is some absorption as well. Uh, but typically, if, if, an, if a signal is being 100% reflected, then amplitude would not be affected. Would it affect frequency? Would it affect wavelength? No. So really, the only issue that we have here is multiple, um, the signal arriving at the host or at the receiver side in different time frames because of different reflective angles and different reflective properties of the devices that it's hitting. That's called multipath distortion. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. Uh, 
well, actually, we'll talk about it next, I guess. So multipath is a concept of reflection where uh, the signal is reflected by multiple objects within the room um, and uh, causes the signal to be received um, at different times at the receiving device. Uh, Tiju has a question. Is there any survey device that can test for loss due to reflection versus absorption or even multipath? You can do active surveys where you can place APs and, and use spectrum analyzers to measure signal or RSSI, but it's not an exact science, right? Um, because the nature of an office or the nature of a building uh, changes constantly, right? Um, now, as far as measuring specific reflection, that's a very challenging, I, I suppose there's ways that you could do that, right? Um, but that would assume that nothing changes. Uh, the error doesn't change. Somebody doesn't move a filing cabinet. There aren't people in the office. There aren't, you know, chairs being moved around or whatever. So we don't typically survey based on that kind of concept. Uh, we will make note of things that can cause that type of interference, but we don't really measure it. Um, if you're really concerned about that type of interference, the best bet would be to do an active survey where you deploy an access point in the place where you think an access point would go, and you do use various tools to measure really two things, uh, RSSI and signal-to-noise ratio. That's essentially how we, we identify the, the uh, fidelity of a wireless signal is using those values. I hope that answered your question, Tiju. Uh, another way in which reflection affects our Wi-Fi networks is through this thing called multipath, which makes sense. I think I've already kind of described it to you guys. We have different objects in the room. Those objects are at different heights. They have diff they're, from, they're different distances from the access point, and our access point is sending out essentially the same signal in multiple directions. So if I go back to my omnidirectional diagram here, we have this signal that's radiating in, in essentially a donut shape, 360 degrees. Well, it's going to hit multiple objects and reflect off those objects. So, um, and it's hopefully going to be reflected towards the receiver. So you'll get the main signal, but then you're going to get another part of the same wave signal that hits obstacles, uh, uh, obstacles in the environment, gets reflected. Uh, and, and then the wave essentially re reaches the uh, receiver at different times. The, oops, remind me later. All right. Now stations are actually programmed to be able to handle this. Uh, and it's an interesting concept. You often see access points and, and sometimes even clients themselves will have multiple antennas. Uh, and a lot of people think that those antennas are actually there uh, to provide, uh, you know, either a transmit path or receive path, separate transmit path or receive path, or to combine some sort of signal or whatever. But actually, the antennas are used to deal with multipath distortion. That's the whole point of these antennas, and they're actually supposed to be a specific distance apart to be able to do this. Um, now, newer technologies like 802.11ac actually take advantage of multipath uh, to do multi, uh, you know, path combining so that we can actually get receive a better signal by combining the power of those two paths that we received uh, into a single signal. So we actually take an advantage of that multipath distortion. We'll talk a lot more about multipath distortion and, uh, and how it can affect the overall signal. Um, on the next slide, but we'll also get into it a little bit later on when we get into some of the antenna theory and we talk about antenna theory. <clears throat> if a signal is received twice at the same time, the secondary wave gets added to the primary wave, which increases the overall amplitude, right? So that receiver gets twice the positive energy at the same time. Perfect. That means we're getting a very strong signal. Uh, so that's the ideal scenario, but ultimately that's not what occurs, right? Because that would mean that these signals would be arriving at the exact same time. Uh, we call that, by the way, upfade, upfade or a stronger signal. 
although the final receive signal level uh, is stronger, it can never be stronger than the original signal that was transmitted because we can't create energy that didn't exist uh, originally. Okay, But it is stronger than it would have been. But what happens if there's a difference between the primary and the secondary signal? Maybe it's out of phase, right? Uh, if they're not sent at the same time, the receiver is going to receive simultaneous signals, but the crests and the troughs are not going to match, and you might actually receive, uh, or, or you might experience downfading, right? Downfading was where that the signals might actually null each other out. If they're exactly 180 degrees out of phase, they would null each other out. Um, or you would see some sort of downfading when, when they're just slightly out of phase. Um, Noise-canceling headphones do this, right? There's an electronic system that detects or captures all that surrounding noise uh, as it approaches the ear and then um, you know, cancels that noise out. There's no way to mitigate this problem, right? You're, you're going to have reflection in your network, uh, in your environment. Radio frequencies are going to be reflected. So we use technologies in software and in the hardware to essentially identify this. So you see the two antennas on an on a access point or a, a receiver. Uh, we're going to accept a signal from one antenna or the other, but we're not going to accept the signal from both antennas and so on. So. Um, and then with AC technology, we actually uh, utilize that to, to create a, a, a better signal, okay? Uh, there are many other things that can affect the quality of our signal. Scattering is another example. Um, scattering, as, it, uh, as it's diagrammed here, basically means that we're um, reflecting, essentially, or dispersing the, the signal in multiple directions. The effect, the overall effect, is just simply a weaker signal because it's some of the energy is being reflected in other directions along the path um, and so on. So dust and humidity uh, can cause scattering, droplets, bubbles, uh, a roughness of a surface. If a signal is being reflected off a surface but that surface has a rough um, design or it's a it's not a smooth surface that can cause scattering and so on uh, the effect of scattering is going to completely depend on the frequency uh, some frequencies are, are are highly scattered other frequencies are less affected um, and it also depends on what's causing the scattering again we're not changing necessarily the frequency of the, the signal we're not changing the wavelength of the signal but we are changing the amplitude of the power of the signal. Examples of things in an office that might cause scattering, glass walls, uh, reflective but rough surfaces, uh, floors like marble floors, stuff like that, or natural uh, tile floors, stuff like that would cause scattering and so on. Again, not something you can really test for. You can do an active survey and maybe see what the signal strength looks like at a particular point because that would be the effect essentially. It's the lower signal strength. But that's about all you can do. Uh, in a Wi-Fi network, uh, there are two effects of scattering. The first is the degradation of the wave strength. Uh, so the RSSI goes down. And by the way, that means the signal to noise ratio typically goes up. Right, because the lower signal strength means noise has more prevalence in the environment. Uh, and then the second would be that the wave um, gets absorbed or scattered by tree leaves, reflects off uneven surfaces, can cause multipath interference, and so on. Um, but the, the primary effect is just the quality of the signal at the receiver. just gets degraded. The only way to really test this, uh, again, is to use some sort of active scenario where you're deploying an access point and, and checking signal strength and whatnot. Refraction, 
basic concept that you guys understand, I'm sure, uh, occurs when the wave changes direction. Uh, happens when the wave passes from one medium to another. Uh, it only has a minor effect because generally refraction just means that the, the, the amplitude is not being modified. We're not getting any attenuation, although there's going to be some attenuation. It's pretty minimal. Uh, you're not changing the frequency again. You're not changing the wavelength. Um, this would be more typically something we would be concerned with in long distance wireless networks like point to point wireless networks. Interestingly enough, they mentioned this in the book, uh, drier air uh, tends to bend signals away from the earth, whereas humid air, humid air tends to bend signals towards the earth. Very interesting concept. Now, line of sight, simple concept. Uh, over short distances, very simple concept because line of sight literally means line of sight. But line of sight doesn't mean necessarily line of sight from a human eye perspective. Because radio frequencies or radio signals can travel much further than possibly the human eye could see. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you still can't test for line of sight. Line of sight by definition just means you have a clear sight between the sender and the receiver. If you have a tree in the way, if you have a building in the way, uh, obviously that can cause loss uh, in some of the various methods that we've talked about. In order to achieve line of sight over a very, very long distance, you have to have a higher tower, essentially. Uh, we'll talk about the Fresnel zone in a second. Uh, in an outdoor link, if the receiver is placed beyond a certain distance, the curvature of the earth will play a role. So for a six foot person, the horizon appears at about six miles away. Uh, its disappearance is determined by the height of the observer. So you have a higher, uh, the person's taller, the horizon's gonna seem, uh, well, it'll be further away, okay? Testing for line of sight can be done physically with actually looking at the, the signal path, um, but you can also use uh, actual tools to test for line of sight as well. Um, you know, signal strength indicator tools and stuff like that. It's typical stuff that you would see uh, in any kind of wireless deployment scenario. All right. Fresnel zone. Sp spelled Fresnel zone, but pronounced Fresnel. Fresnel. Actually named for uh, a physicist that uh, kind of came up with the concept. Uh, it is a series of, it's not really depicted on the diagram very well here, but it's a series of concentric prolate ellipse, uh, ellipses, um, which are regions of space between and around the transmitting antenna. You can kind of see them here listed uh, in this uh, diagram. So this is supposed to be that uh, prolate ellipsoidal region that I just described. There's four of them on this diagram uh, between the transmitting and the receiving system. Now, the concept is uh, defined to understand or compute the strength of the waves, in this case, in our, in our case, uh, radio waves, uh, as they propagate from the transmitter to the receiver. All right. Now, there are, well, a lot of scientific things that we can get into when we're describing uh, the Fresnel zone, but uh, what's the overall goal here? The overall goal is to, to, to define the impact of objects or things in the path that would cause interference with our signal. Each Fresnel zone gets defined uh, by the phase shift, uh, which then gets transmitted in our sine wave uh, and then deflects off an object within that region and continues towards the receiver. Uh, so you might, in this particular example, you might look at the, the line of sight from point A to point B as the red line, but the, the zone or the cone of Eh, the Fresnel zone, I guess, is this solid 
football shaped area. Now we can have signal that uh, that exceeds that, right? That goes outside of that area, but that's going to be affected by obstacles in the path and so on. Uh, that's what we call the Fresnel zone clearance. Uh, and that's the area that we can transmit and receive the waves without any, have any, having any kind of interference. Uh, the book describes it a little bit differently, but it's essentially the same concept that I describe. Right? In fact, I'll go through what the, what the book describes here. Uh, radio line of sight, uh, which, uh, oh, TJ had a question here. So the line of sight does not have to be this on, on the same plane. No, it does not. Antenna can be higher or lower than the receiver, especially when you're dealing with directional antennas. Um, yes, they can be higher or lower, but keep in mind uh, that could affect that overall um, Fresnel zone, right? You see that little mountaintop that's next to our building here. Uh, if this receiver was 10 feet lower, uh, we might still have line of sight, right? So imagine that this red line is just right above that mountaintop, uh, but our Fresnel zone would be significantly decreased, right? The radio line of sight, even if it matches the model of a straight line or a visual line of sight, is more than a simple line. That's what they're describing here in this particular case. If obstacles are close, but not directly in the path, so not within the direct line of sight, the radio waves that reflect off those objects might arrive out of phase. So we get multipath distortion to the receiver. And that can increase or decrease the power based on the phase of that signal and so on. One way to mitigate interference is to ensure that you have a minimum distance between the direct line of, uh, of the signal and the closest obstacle. Uh, and that distance will define that, that zone, right? Uh, Augustine Jean Fresnel a uh, 19th century physicist provided a method for calculating where reflections will be in phase and out of phase around the direct lines between the sender and receiver. And that's what creates these corresponding zones. All right. Uh, they say, look at it as an American football. You can kind of see that representation here. The sender and receiver at each end of the ball and there's an imaginary line from one to the other. Theoretically, there's an infinite number of zones, but the area of main concern is the first zone, which is the center zone, and that should be kept primarily free from obstructions to avoid interference. Uh, and you can see that's also the largest zone as well. Um, and uh, the, the general recommendation is to make sure that you um, keep at least 80% uh, excuse me, 60% free from obstacles in that zone, all right? You guys are not going to have to calculate any kind of Fresnel zone stuff on the exam. It's just a concept to, to consider. I've done a lot of deployments, a lot of deployments with um, wireless, especially outdoors, and not once have I ever actually calculated a Fresnel zone. Um, I, you know, you, you look at line of sight and, and, uh, make your best guess, right? And then you use active, active testing to test uh, the success of your design, all right? All right. We only have a couple more concepts uh, to cover in this chapter, uh, but the next one that we're gonna talk about is perhaps the most important, which is our SSI and signal to noise ratio, okay? RSSI stands for the Received Signal Strength Indicator. Now I'm going to spend a lot of time on this because I think this is one of the most important concepts of this entire part of the lesson. It's a measurement of power uh, present in a received radio signal, obviously, received radio, uh, signal strength indicator. RSSI is usually invisible to a user or a receiving device unless you're using some sort of tool to actually measure that value. And most wireless testing tools will have the capability of measuring RSSI and identifying what that signal strength is. Uh, in the terms of 802.11, uh, those tools are readily available and easy to use. Now, the RSSI value is 
usually derived in what we call the intermediate frequency stage before the IF amplifier. All right. Now, I'm not going to get into the details of that, but uh, we don't have to get into the specifics of the, the electronics of it. But um, let me talk about, because this, this can be a little bit confusing with regard to what's a good value, what's a bad value, and so on. You can see on the diagram here that you've got a couple of things to consider, right? Signal to noise ratio versus the signal strength. Now you want the signal to noise ratio to be a very low value, right? You want high signal, low noise. Actually, that would mathematically be a high value, right? If my signal is 20 and my noise is one, uh, signal to noise as a ratio would be 20 divided by one, which would be 20. That's a good value, right? Um, it doesn't matter how strong the power is. Uh, in this case, they're representing the power as a, as a milliwatt. Uh, it doesn't matter how strong the, the power is. If there's a high level of noise, it's ineffective. Okay. In 802.11, we use RSSI to measure the relative received signal strength of the wireless network. Uh, it's an arbitrary unit, by the way. Uh, it's not... It's not a predefined unit, it's kind of an arbitrary number. But it is an indication of the power level be re being received by the receiver radio after the antenna and possible cable loss and then free path loss and everything else that comes into play. So the higher the RSSI number, the stronger the signal. If you have an RSSI value that's represented, um, uh, well actually you'll see this a lot. When an RSSI value is represented in a negative form, the closer the value is to zero, the stronger the received signal is. All right, so minus 65 dBm is uh, good. Actually, that's kind of the threshold, but minus 20 dBm is better, right? So the closer, you, when it's measured in a, in a negative for, format, the closer you are to zero, the better the signal strength. Um, RSSI can be used internally and it often is, by the wireless network card to determine the amount of energy that a channel is, is, uh, is, is being received at. So I can move to a different channel or move to a different access point. Uh, it also defines uh, the clear to send component. We'll talk about the, the CSMACD process a little bit later on. But once a card is clear to send, the packet information can then be sent uh, and uses can observe RSSI values when they're measuring the signal strength of a wireless network through the use of their monitoring tools. There's, there's a Wireshark can do this, a Kismet, Insider, uh, in S-S-I-D-E-R, that's one that I typically use. Uh, Cisco network cards actually have an RSSI maximum value of 100, um, and they'll report different power levels, but the RSSI values are typically zero to 100. Um, other chipsets will use different methods. So that's what they mean by when they say it's an, or that's what I mean when I say it's an arbitrary value because it depends on the vendor and how they've chosen to implement that in their environment. So you'd have to be kind of identify which vendor it is to see what's good and what's bad. There's no standardized relationship of any particular physical parameter to actual RSSI values. Uh, in other words, in 802.11, we don't define a relationship between RSSI value and power level in milliwatts and decibels, etc. So vendors, like I said, chipset makers. Will actually provide their own method, whether it's granularity or or accuracy, etc. Um, uh, and so on. So you really have to look at the vendor to identify what's what's positive and what's negative. Now in 802.11 there's actually another specification um, called RCPI which is received channel power indicator. That's a measure of received radio frequency power uh, on a particular channel over um, you know actually through the protocol with the preamble and the um, from the preamble over to the, the entire received frame. Uh, and those are absolute values, but we don't uh, really get into that too much. Uh, typically, you're going to see 99% of the time um, 
you're going to see uh, RSSI measured in a negative value from 0 to 100. And uh, obviously, the <clears throat> lower that value is to 0, the more uh, signal strength you have. Okay. Now, signal-to-noise ratio, I don't think I really need to describe that too much. Uh, the higher the signal-to-noise ratio, the better. It is a ratio, which means signal is on top, noise is on the bottom. So signal is 20, noise is 1, that's a value of 20. If signal is 20 and noise is 10, that's a value of 2. So the higher the SNR, the better. Right? The higher the signal to noise, the better. And uh, it's just basically a measure of signal strength relative to the noise on the same frequency. All right? Um, and uh, SNR is basically defined as signal over noise. I don't need to really describe what noise is. I think you guys understand. Lots of things that can cause that. Now, they do talk about some other things here, uh, and uh, I'll mention a few of these things. Uh, the calculation of RSSI, if you think about it for, for a second here, in order to measure RSSI, effectively wouldn't you really have to know what the original signal strength was because you know how can you say i'm getting 80 percent of the signal 80 percent of the amplitude if i didn't know what the actual original amplitude was so that can be kind of challenging um that's why it's not really a finite value it's more of a graded value um and uh, i mentioned that before the grade value which is uh usually depicted in dBMs, that's de uh, decibels based on uh, a reference of milliwatt. There's dBDs, there's dBs, and there's dBMs. We'll talk about the difference of those later on. Uh, it depends on the vendor, like I said. Um, and uh, minus 95 um, is not as uh, ni uh, strong of a signal as, say, a minus 15, because as you get to zero, um, the signal strength goes up. For Cisco products, a good RSSI value would be, would be minus 65 dBm or better, which be minus 65, minus 55, minus 45, etc. Uh, you can get away with minus 80, minus 90, but typically we try to stay within that minus 65 or better range. Very important if you guys are doing surveys or you're trying to troubleshoot connectivity problems, you're going to want to measure RSSI, you know, that's a good number to know. All right. Now, noise, or what they call the noise floor, noise floor would be uh, the representation of this line right here. This is the noise floor. That's where we can differentiate between the noise and the signal. Uh, will affect the signal as well. And that's what we call the signal to noise ratio. Uh, I've already described it. I think, uh, I think you guys have a good understanding of that. Um, <clears throat> signal to noise ratio is measured as a positive integer, uh, typically between 0 and 120. The closer that you get to 120, the better. Uh, so that's, again, something to look at when you're using a tool like NS Insider or uh, other wireless sniffing tools. Uh, it compares two values, the signal to the noise. It's, it's called the signal to noise ratio. If I have an RSSI of minus 55 and my noise value is minus 95, all right, which is lower, it, it's kind of counterintuitive, minus 95 is lower than minus 55, then I have a signal to noise ratio of 40 because I take my minus 55, I subtract the minus 95, that gives me a plus 95, which gives me a signal to noise ratio of 40. Uh, in general, anything above 20 is considered to be good. Even though 120 is the highest level, actually 20 is considered to be a, a good value. All right. All right. So that uh, concludes that lesson. Uh, we talked, you know, very briefly about the wireless spectrum. Uh, different ranges, uh, audio, uh, audio range versus the uh, radio frequency range versus the, uh, uh, the light, uh, the visible light range and, 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 on, non, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, how different frequencies 
are affected. Um, we talked about wavelength and amplitude. Uh, when a wave is uh, uh, sent out, what are th some of the things that can cause distortion or loss as the signal goes through obstacles? What causes that signal to experience loss, etc., uh, and so on. So what we're going to do in the next lesson, um, oh, yeah, we also talked about uh, reflection, ref <laughs> reflection and refraction, scattering, uh, the Fresnel zone. Uh, which defines that football shaped area that should be free of obstacles if we want to maintain our, our integrity on our site to site transmissions, RSSI, and the signal to noise ratio. What we're going to talk about in the next lesson is, uh, well, really get into the weeds here because we're going to get into radio frequency math. Um, common values used to describe power, dBD, uh, watts, milliwatts, decibels. Uh, we'll take a look at uh, laws of three and laws of ten, all kinds of interesting things. It's going to be a good chapter. Um, very, very technical, but very important uh, when you're designing and, and uh, dealing with wireless networks. All right?